So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is David Phillips. I'm the Integrated Manager of Care at Home Services within Dundee Health and Social Care Partnership, uh, which is a, a kind of offshoot of Dundee City Council. Uh, for those who don't know, I'll let my colleague introduce herself. Hi, my name is Lisa Barrett. I'm the Acting Team Manager for Home Care Citywide Care at Home Team. Thank you, Lisa. So myself and Lisa, um, we work within the Dundee Health and Social Care Partnership Care at Home Teams, and we're working on a recruitment pathway for people like yourself to understand a little bit more about our jobs, where those jobs are advertised, a little bit about um, what we consider to be a good application, um, also a poor application. So we're hoping that people can give some of the candidates pointers around those sections. We'll also look at the way we shortlist and we'll describe a little bit about that, a little bit about our interview process, um, a little bit as well around you know, what to expect at the interview, but what happens after the interview, how we contact successful candidates, what's expected of candidates in terms of paperwork that needs to be sent back around criminal declarations, a little bit about what makes us a good employer for um, people to apply for our jobs, and the benefits of working for uh, the partnership and Dundee City Council. Um, some of this will be probably very familiar to a lot of you. Um, however, um, we're trying to aim this at a target audience that kind of have a lot of footfall in terms of job applications. So uh, apologies for anybody that's, you know, if it's blaringly obvious what we're, we're referring to. Thank you for attending today, however, because we do appreciate it. So, um, I will start my presentation. What I'm going to do is there is a couple of screens I will probably come in and out of because um, I'm going to show you where our job packs are and where our jobs are advertised. So essentially our job adverts are all advertised on My Job Scotland uh, and I provided the link and what I'll do is the presentation will be shared um, with Andy, for example, who can hopefully pass this out to everybody. The link for the specific jobs we're requesting people look at are listed. Um, we have rolling adverts, so they appear every day. Um, something Lisa was quite keen to progress was rolling adverts because we have instances where we lose a bit of time when we close down an advert to do shortlisting and applications. We then can be several weeks before that uh, adverts put back up on My Job Scotland. So we have rolling adverts now, and they appear every day and will continue to appear for a prolonged period of time. The way um, Lisa kind of shortlists and interviews, we'll discuss that kind of later on. But what you will see on adverts is that the salary and working hours are always listed. And each advert has a specific job description and person specification for that post and a job pack. So in for the purposes of the presentation, I've added in hyperlinks to all of those things so that you can click on them and view them. Um, but I'm going to just drag in a different screen, um, which is the screen that um, you would go to once you click on the My Job Scotland link. So I'm going to overlay that onto the presentation. So what you would see on this job advert is the salary range, uh, the contract time and the hours of work. It gives you a very uh, specific overview of the job description, the requirements and responsibilities and a little bit about the individual. But towards the bottom, it has key attachments. And the first one being the job description for that specific post. So this is the job description that Lisa would base her um, shortlisting on. So again, it gives you a bit about the job purpose, the contacts, the main duties of the post um, and the job activities itself. But more importantly, towards the bottom, it goes on to uh, a person specification, which is the main elements of the shortlisting part. So you will see columns, essential requirements, desirable, and how then we assess the candidate as appropriate for that post. So, you know, when we're talking about ability to achieve an SVQ2, we're not asking people to have that award. However, if they can demonstrate how they would possibly achieve that through, you know, previous prior learning, et cetera, we would then take and assess that via their application form. Um, we also have kind of sections around work experience, so past and present, uh, but life or work experience. We don't expect any candidates to have uh, formal care experience. And again, the method assessment would be at the side here. We would take some of those um, from the application form, but also would explore some of that at the interview process. And again, particular skills and abilities, kind of the, the bog standard in some respects about communication, working as part of a team, 
using your own initiative. Um, so they're all in there. Um, and where we would also get some of that information from is references. You know, part of our references ask how the person was as a team player, um, how good is their written oral communication. Um, so some of this is picked up uh, through the application, the shortlisting, the interview, and also the references. So it's good for candidates to be reminded of that. Um, that is obviously for you guys to have a read of at your leisure. I won't go through all of that today. Um, the second part of the um, description on My Job Scotland is the job information pack. So we'll take a few of these examples out today as part of the presentation, but essentially the job information pack covers these key areas, terms and conditions of employment, how you would apply, selection process, working and living in Dundee, um, and how that kind of can benefit the person. Um, I won't go through the whole document because it's quite lengthy, but it talks about how you would apply, um, how you get access to application forms. It mentions our guaranteed job interview scheme for people with disabilities. And it's worth noting that although we have a job uh, guarantee interview scheme, the person still has to meet the core essential elements of the person spec that I showed you earlier. Um, we also have um, equal opportunities and, you know, kind of disclaimers around personal information and, you know, a bit more insight into the selection process uh, as a whole. So if you're interested for an interview, what you can expect, um, recruitment and selection pre-employment checks, what are they? How do we go about that? Um, Asylum, Asylum and Immigration Act 1996 as well applies and, um, you know, there's there's parts of, you know, today's presentation that will focus on, you know, visas and the right to work scheme, etc. Also, we ask for qualifications. If people listed qualifications and they relate to kind of a care regulatory body, we do ask for copies of those. But again, it's in the main bulk of the presentation. But criminal convictions, driving licenses, disclosure checks and references, it's all in there. So um, always please pass out to your candidates that, you know, that's a good source of information. Um, so back to the main presentation then. I'm just checking everybody can still see the screen because I've come out of a few different screens. So yeah, perfect. So what makes a good application for us? So applicants, you know, when it comes to writing applications, people kind of put different aspects into it, but we would like applicants to have a good example of their care experience, whether, as we've said, it's life or paid care and not just bullet points. And, you know, we always ask people, tell us why you would make a good carer. Um, and it doesn't have to be those formal attributes of paid care. Um, we've had many people shown qualities where they've looked after loved ones that have been unwell or they've looked after children, et cetera, that, you know, are, are their children, but they've, they've, you know, foster care, et cetera. But also those life skills from other areas. Um, and we had quite a good example of a hairdresser that Lisa recently interviewed who had all the core elements we were looking for in terms of communication, team working, um, assessing situations, and that was a very good example of a career change for that individual. Again, we look for applicants to showcase values and qualities um, that they can demonstrate to carry out this caring role. Um, it doesn't have to be an exhaustive list. It's kind of three or four different examples of, you know, their personality, their values, and what they see as a good quality to bring to us. Most importantly, however, awareness of the job role. We do get applications where people have started writing them and it's talking about a different service. And we've had some examples of people talking about children's services. Um, that this particular job relates to adult services um, and it's obviously an older adult population. So we do uh, look for that awareness of the job role. And it's all in the person spec and it's in the job role um, paperwork that's attached to the job description. So. Yeah, please ask your candidates to read that and when they're writing their application to link into that. And again, like I've mentioned about that hairdresser, it's what they can bring to the role, the transferable skills that make them a unique individual. Um, and as we've always said, the essential criteria that's listed on that person spec needs to be linked into the application. And I'll come on to why that is in a minute when we talk about the shortlisting. Now, what would we consider a poor application? Um, we never want applicants to, to kind of feel particularly bad about their application, but there is some core elements we probably need to highlight. If we just get applications through that are just a few lines of text to the panel, it doesn't really show enthusiasm for the job. Um, and that's quite important. We've had applications where, you know, we're not expecting huge, 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 you know, four or five pages of A4 filled in with all this text, but 
we do expect candidates to kind of show that enthusiasm for, for the role they're applying for. And they've not read the, spec the specification in terms of the person specification listed for what the role actually entails. So they're probably talking about something in their application form that doesn't link into that person spec. Um, and again, the essential criteria is very important when writing an application. We are not great, it's not great when you see application forms that are just bullet points. We are looking for really good experience examples as to why they wish to be considered for the post. Um, one of the things that Lisa finds more often than not as well is that when people are filling application forms, it does state two application, uh, two references are, are mandatory, but a lot of people just put one and there's a huge time delay in that aspect because after the process, we need to go back to applicants to get second references and that can sometimes be two, three, four weeks work down the line before the reference is sent in. So um, we always ask people to please write two, two references down. Also, there's many sections of an application form, although there's the core kind of skills, the person specification, please tell us why you want to apply. There is specific questions around, you know, do you drive? Um, do you have uh, any considerations that need to be met? Um, you know, qualification sections and some of that information can sometimes be blank, which leads us to then have to go back to the candidate and ask them to provide those extra details to, in order to, to consider their application. So again, the qualifications and relevant information sections need to be filled in. And why do we do that? Why do we ask that? It's essentially because the quality of the application will be our first impression. So they should allow some time to make sure they complete all the sections fully and accurately to help us when we come to shortlisting. So the individual, what are we looking for? So as you said, they'll have past present care experience in your life or work experience or demonstrate the skills needed to care. So again, that's that extra caveat around we don't expect people to have formal care, care experience. If they can demonstrate how they could care for an individual or how they intend to care for individuals, that's good enough for us to show that they've kind of thought through the role. Um, good oral and written communication skills. Now our client group solely rely on that good communication written skills in terms of care planning, written skills in, in terms of contact notes. So that's a real uh, area that we do focus on. And the usual ones, we've all had you know, jobs, the usual spiel in there is around working as a team member. But again, we want our team members to work well together. Um, but however, they also have to work on their own. So it's having those two blended approaches of being a good team member. What does that mean to the individual, but also working on their own initiative? Assessment skills, you know, that means different things to different people, but essentially assessment skills are there to, to support that kind of balanced approach to caring individuals. You know, you're prescribed different tasks for that individuals to do, but your assessment skills are important in, in identifying if that person needs more care. So we ask people to be quite vigilant around assessing skills, but assessing um, abilities of individuals, risks to individuals. So again, a key area for us. And again, that doesn't have to be care specific. People have brought examples from, uh, again, I'm going to go back to that hairdresser. She has a whole host of assessment skills around, you know, being methodical about hair dyes and risk assessments around equipment lying around and, you know, sort of stuff. So she was able to demonstrate that she is aware of how to assess particular areas of her current employment and how she would transfer them over to us, which is great. Um, and again, one of the biggies, showing sensitivity and understanding in dealing with vulnerable people and being non-judgmental. Um, we ask our service users what it means to them in terms of new candidates coming in, and they would like their, their um, members of staff to be caring, pleasant and professional in their approach, which is quite right in all honesty. Um, I think as well, dependable and have reliable attitude to work. When we're supporting people who are vulnerable, that dependability and reliability is very important for them for continuity. They might be relying on that person to help them in the morning with a specific task or in the evening, but the staff member has to have that dependable and reliable attitude towards their working week. Um, and obviously they'll be required to work a range of shifts, including split shifts, evenings, weekends, and of course there will be a requirement to do further studying and training relating to the SVQ. I've got a section about the SVQ later on, so I'm not going too in-depth into that just now, but essentially, you know, we do support our candidates through the training modules needed. So the individual has to have the ability and the enthusiasm to do those qualifications. So a little bit about our people charter. I'm not going to 
um, you know, read off of that. Um, I'm just going to pick a few out. You know, we as a as a an employer, a fair work employer, we have a people charter, and it looks for specific values um, around employees of Dundee City Council. So, um, I'll, again, this will be shared with you, so I won't read it kind of line by line. But it's about being flexible, uh, being dynamic and responsive, engaging with um, communities, um, contributing successfully with other partnership areas. You know, remaining aspirational, optimistical, optimistic with a can-do approach. So these are kind of the people charter uh, aspirations and values we look for in an individual. Again, that's in the the job pack for people to read. So again, if people you know reference some of these, then that's that's great. They get a big tick from us in terms of showing that enthusiasm and initiative. So shortlisting stage. So after the application's in, what happens? So all panel members who are going to be on the interviewing stage must shortlist. So that's a must. We don't ask people to interview a candidate if they've not first seen their application. So that that shortlisting process is quite quite strict around who's on the panel must shortlist. Obviously, all our shortlisting is recorded for candidates in case they want feedback at a later date. We're also audited on our shortlisting, so we need to make sure that's robust and it's recorded accurately. Um, when we shortlist, Candidates that have identified exactly how they'll meet the essential criteria are shortlisted usually to the interview stage. Um, and the rule of thumb is if it lists something in that section, it needs to be written on the application how the person can or could achieve it. Um, and that's the benchmark we set is the essential criteria. If you don't show essential criteria, then you're unlikely to get through to the next stage. Um, when, if the criteria is met, the candidate is contacted directly to attend an interview, and candidates are usually selected for the interview um, using the contact address they provided on the application. Um, that's usually if someone's been booked in um, on our old platform, which means they're sent an email and they're asked to book a slot. At the moment, we have a different process in place around doing our interviews weekly, on Microsoft Teams, there's a slight different process around the panel members will contact you directly to book in that interview. Um, so what does the interview stage look like? So again, like I said, Microsoft Teams, usually weekly, candidates will be asked their preferred time. We do work around people's schedules and commitments. We don't you know, shortlist on the Friday and say you need to be here on Monday for an interview. We usually give people a little bit of time to prepare for that. We do try and make it relaxed. Myself and Lisa have done many interviews where, you know, we can see how nervous candidates can be, but we try and make it as informal as process as informal as process as we can. It is a formal process, but we make it informal by having a little bit of time just to kind of introduce ourselves, um, have a rundown of the format so people know what to expect at the interview. Um, you know, if there's different sections of the interview, how we structure that. So that gives people that little bit of time just to embed straight into the interview and hopefully it's a relaxing environment. Something Lisa's quite passionate about is the scenario based questions. We don't expect anyone to ever be able to answer any specific operational questions. So if we've got a procedure in place, a candidate that's external to us will not know what that procedure is. So. We never ask procedure based questions. We ask scenario based questions. Um, and that obviously gives us a, kind of a, a steering on, on how the candidate can possibly display the right behaviours and attitude when carrying out the role, essentially. Um, there's usually two to three people on the panel. And, you know, in all cases, you know, there's usually a team manager and two social care organisers. But sometimes there is two, but it would usually be our minimum. And they're always chaired by the team manager, which in this case is, in most cases, Lisa Bowring, who's on the call today. We all take panel notes. We refer back to um, our panel notes when making decisions. We usually tell candidates we're writing down panel notes because they sometimes see us scribbling down. And, you know, we're very open in front about we need to record some of this because we need to make a decision later on. Um, candidates who are successful are always contacted by someone on the panel to offer that um, opportunity to them. Unsuccessful are contacted by a recruitment team directly, um, but there is an opportunity for them to ask us feedback about why they were not successful. We ask people kind of the core elements of any interview, be prepared, know what job you're interviewing for, but also don't be afraid to ask the panel questions. Um, 
that's really important because again, there's there's people that don't know about our role specifically. So it's okay to ask questions about the role. It's okay to expand upon something or ask as a direct question about that. But one thing that we 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 do see sometimes is that candidates are reading off a script, especially when on Microsoft Teams. Sometimes a candidate saying word for word what's on a piece of paper. Now it's okay to be prepared, it's okay to have notes, but we ask our candidates to to refrain from that because it doesn't show us necessarily that they're able to understand about the job and articulate why they would meet some of the criteria of the, the post. It just shows that they've written something down and they're reading it word for word. And sometimes when we've gone to ask a question that they're not prepared for, you can tell it's not on the notes that they've got in front of them. So all we're asking for is people to be prepared. Yes, take notes, but know what job you're interviewing for because that's all you really need to do. Key employment check. So if we've offered you a role, which means we've offered the candidate um, a position, but based on going through to the next stage, which is pre-employment checks, each person needs to have given two references, of course. Contact is made by email for those references. Um, one thing we need to highlight is that we're unable to take emails that are not corporate in nature. So if a person's listed a lecturer from college or uh, a nurse from Nine Mills Hospital, we can't then submit an, a reference to someone with a Hotmail email account or a Gmail email account. It needs to be the corporate account for that college, university or establishment. So Nine Wells, for example, all the contacts there have NHS.scot email accounts. If there is some disparity in terms of someone saying, look, my lecturer or college person doesn't have a corporate email account, we will send a reference to the registered address for that establishment so it could be done by hand by the person. But we're unable to take Hotmail and Gmail account references, partly due because we don't know who's writing the reference. Um, of all good intentions, I'm sure the person who's appropriately doing the reference is doing it correctly. But we have had such situations where people have been sent Hotmail references and it's quite clear that the person's not a, a registered body that's able to give that reference and someone's writing on their behalf. So we have specific safe recruiting policies we need to adhere to, and that is one of them, unfortunately. Um, one reference needs to be the current or previous employer. So school, college, university is also included in that. You know, young people coming into jobs, sometimes don't have previous employment experience, but they've got um, educational um, facilities behind them, school leavers, college leavers, university leavers. We also ask the candidates to remind the referees that references have been sent because we find the biggest hold up is that it's gone to someone's spam account folder or they've got it, they've remembered they've got it, but then they forgot to fill it in and the candidates then waiting for all these pre-employment checks. And we've had people sometimes wait beyond four weeks to eight weeks for a reference to come back, which delays them starting in their new position. Um, we always ask for a PVG and criminal declaration form. So the criminal declaration is the candidate advising us of any criminal convictions. The PVG is the projection of vulnerable groups application. We would do that for the candidate and we would pay for that for them for to be undertaken. There's no monetary cost to them. But what we do need is ID checks, so copies of driving licenses, passports and proof of address to allow that PVG scheme membership to be um, applied for. Um, candidates will also be asked to bring original copies of all the relevant uh, educational and professional qualifications. A copy needs to be taken for our records and unfortunately if the original certificates are not available, they must obtain a copy through the issuing body, whether that be the SQA, a college, a university, etc. So after all of that, so the PVGs come back, um, the person's references are accepted and they're fine. What we then do is, is we discuss a start date with the candidate, but it's worth noting we don't ask candidates to give notice to their current employer until all those checks are done. So we would never ask an individual, right, give your notice, but we're also still waiting on your references. We would wait until the references in the PVG are back in the criminal declaration form, and then we would discuss when can you start, what is your notice period, and then we would plan them into that transition over to our, our um, employment. Prior to starting, though, there is some details needed, and these are sent via email. It's banking details, core details, next to kin details, et cetera, which would be asked for via email by our recruitment team, and they will be kind of embedded into the 
staff members profile for them ready to start their employment journey with us. Um, it's worth saying as well, all new staff must attain certain training that we provide, and that's moving and handling training, first aid training and food hygiene. Now, the first aid and food hygiene don't have to be done straight away, but the moving and handling does to be able to allow that person to undertake any particular moving and handling with service users. It's worth saying as well, our social care organisers will contact the person to book a place for these uh, training courses, and they'll also start to discuss uniform, equipment, mobile phone, backpacks that we all provide, so there's no cost to the employee. And then what happens after that is essentially shadowing shifts are arranged, where you start your buddy up with an experienced social care worker, and ongoing support and induction then commences. Um, so just a role specific interview, um, Lisa, could make the um, presentation yesterday. So I wrote a few details down for Lisa. So Lisa, feel free to come in after I've said this section, but essentially the role is 25 hours a week. It's evenings and weekends in terms of the shifts. I've put a little bit about the start times because people often think, you know, what are the start times that 7 a.m. or 7.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. So we do ask some some of our runs to start at 7 a.m. And the latest the team's work is 10 p.m. However, it is acknowledged that occasionally if the last visit of the night, there's some sort of emergency call or you know, you're waiting on an ambulance, some things that, that end time can be a little bit more flexible. However, we try and keep that to a very minimum. But when you're dealing with people, some days it can be very um, you know, last minute. And candidates will assist in maintaining service users in their own homes in the community by attending to their sense personal and social care needs. So that is fundamentally why we're here. Lisa, do you want to add anything into that that I've missed? Yeah, just to clarify, the 25 hours per week are worked over a two and a half day period over seven days. So it's two split shifts. So like David said, if you're working seven o'clock in the morning to 1 p.m. in the afternoon, you'll come back out at half past six at night to 10 o'clock at night. If you work from seven in the morning to half past ten in the morning, then you'll come out and do a four o'clock in the afternoon until ten. And there is also a middle shift that sometimes we cover between four o'clock and eight. On the person's third day, which is their half day, they will always work an early shift, finishing at either one or one thirty to maximise their days off. So they're two and a half days, but as I say, that that's split over over seven days. So that's where we are with that. Thank you, Lisa. That's really helpful. Thank you. So why are we a good employer and what are the employee benefits? So I've taken this little snapshot from the job pack, but essentially there's lots of benefits working for us. And, you know, you know, our annual leave increments rise to 31 days after five years service. There's public holidays throughout the year um, at Christmas and New Year. There's incremental salary scales. Um, you know, there's access to occupational health supports, learning and development opportunities. There's also the contribution to the pension scheme. So all our employees are automatically enrolled into the pension scheme. However, if they didn't want to be part of that scheme, they can opt out. It's not a mandatory aspect. However, if you're in the scheme, um, Dundee City Council pay 17% into that pension fund for you. So again, a good incentive for people looking to build up a pension fund. Um, as well, you know, there's other supports in there, there's ill health retirement enhancements, death and service payments. There's also some kind of um, support in terms of car salary sacrifice schemes where you can apply for uh, vehicles through your employment with Dundee City Council. And instead of that sort of normal PCP route or you know higher purchase agreements, you can do it through your uh, wages. And I think the tax relief on it is there's some sort of incentive, but you know, persons looking to apply for it can find out a lot about, about that. There's also the cycle to work scheme, which I've also used, um, where the council uh, gave me quite a large amount of money to purchase a bike for myself. And again, you don't pay as much tax on it. So it came out my wages every month and it was a really good piece of equipment to help me kind of cycle to work and get a little bit fitter. So these are some kind of, you know, benefits to an employee. Additional benefits, career progression, you know, we've got a team of 22 social care organisers who most of them started out as frontline staff members and they transitioned into the office to become managers of those frontline teams. And we've also had organisers who have moved up to team managers level 
And we've also had team managers move up to integrated managers level. So there's a lot of career progression within the council. You also, not that we're trying to lose people before we've got them, you do get access to a lot of further training and development that's both professional and personal. People can apply to do various different courses, um, sometimes through the Open University that we'll pay for or we'll part fund. Um, but one of the main incentives is we pay for all our candidates' qualification. So the SVQ2, we pay for. But we also pay for study leave to obtain those qualifications. So we allow staff members time off from work um, to obtain those qualifications. So we're not asking them to you know, be unpaid to get a day off work to do a qualification. It's worth saying as well, all our workforce is registered with the Scottish Services Social Council. Well, I've always, always get that wrong. The SSC, as we call it, the Social Services Scotland Council. No, I've got that wrong again. Um, basically, we pay for the registration fees for our workforce to register with them, um, which is important because all our workforce has to be registered with the SSC. Um, some general terms and conditions, which I won't read out, uh, be part of the presentation pack you get, just about how people are paid, how their leave works, how sick pay works, um, and how the pension works. But again, that's in the job pack. Um, and contact details. So I've put Lisa Byron's name down because Lisa deals with all our recruitment. So her phone number and email address is there in case any of you guys want to catch up with her at a later date, ask a question or email through and say, you know, is there any update to your jobs? Is there any new jobs coming? Or if you've got a general question about today's presentation, you can get in contact with Lisa and Lisa can get in contact with myself and we can sort some question and answers out. So that concludes our presentation. Um, I'm just going to open it up to questions for anybody on the call um, about any of those aspects. Silent. That's OK. Thank, thank you very much, David and Lisa. Um, I don't have any questions at the moment, but if if we do have some specifics, it's good to know um, that we can give um, Lisa uh, a wee email uh, and, and certainly if there's people from the partnership who have specific questions about their clients and um, they're welcome to contact us uh, if if uh, need be. So we might be able to take care of any questions, first of all. Uh, so I will put the slides and some and the links that were mentioned today um, and our contact details um, in an email and send it out to um, the folks this afternoon. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate that was quite a whistle stop tour of care at home. But it, like we've said, if any of you has any questions, we're, we're here to, to answer them, even at a later date, as Andy said, you know, all these slides will go out to everybody. So feel free to pass them widely as well to other colleagues um, and we'll hopefully be able to help down the line with any questions you might have.